A bank founded by a garment workers union and a global ice cream company founded by a couple of hippies from Brooklyn. This week, I sit down with Keith Mestrich of Amalgamated Bank and later Ben and Jerry of Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream. All that and a few words from me on the human cost of automation or my miserable travel experience. Welcome to the Laura Flanders Show, where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. on this program we talk about evil big banks break up the big banks we say embrace credit unions well I'm not changing any of that but we are going to talk <laughs> to somebody who's in charge of a big bank right now it's the amalgamated bank but it's a little different and it's using its power in the banking world to make some progressive change the CEO of the amalgamated bank for the last couple of years is our guest Keith Mestrich welcome to the program Keith. thanks Glad Laura nice you. to be here Amalgamated. Tell us its history. Founded in the 20s. It's a fascinating history. Founded in 1923 by a visionary thinker named Sidney Hillman and the uh, Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America in New York City. Founded when banking was really the purview of the rich, much like it is today. And why was uh, it founded? It was founded really to be able to give immigrant garment workers, a million of them in New York City at the time, a place where they could actually conduct financial transactions. Um, at that time, a lot of banks charged working people to keep their money in the bank. We offered the first free savings accounts. And the bank really invented the first system of foreign remittances so that garment workers who were here to find a better life could bring their families back home, back over here from abroad. Now, you worked as a union organizer for mm -hmm. years until recently. What made you want to go and be CEO of a bank? I had the fortune a couple of years ago to be the uh, chief of staff of the, of the union that still owns the bank today. The union at that time was called Unite. And at that time, I saw the potential of what the real power of organizing the money, not only of the trade union community, but the money um, of the progressive movement um, could do if we really put it all in one place and we could think about actually using those resources for good as opposed to just using them for service provision. So first talk about the problems. Um, lay out what, it, what the situation is vis-a-vis -vis banking in America. The last statistic I saw was a large proportion approaching a third of Americans are unbanked? Is that possibly right? There, it, it, it very well might be. There's, a, there's an enormous number of problems in the, in the system. It's still a very complicated system. We use a jargon and, and a language that's, that's complicated for people to understand um, how they can actually use the financial system to their, to their benefit. But a lot of it's really because there is not a lot of money to be made by the traditional banking system in underserved communities. Mm. Um, poor people don't keep a lot of money in the bank. Um, that makes it hard for the their, their accounts to be profitable for most banking institutions. It really takes a partnership between government and the banking system to figure out ways to, to make it work. So how has the amalgamated, how are you helping to expand access to banking for those populations? Sure, a, a, a number of things. Most importantly, um, we have open branches in underbanked areas in the, in the New York City area where we still have a physical footprint. Um, working with uh, the, the city and the state to seed those branches with some municipal deposits, we've been able to have enough deposits to keep a, a brick and mortar branch uh, open so that we can provide services for people in places like Burnside in the Bronx or West Harlem. Uh, the, uh, the other thing that we're doing is increasingly providing mobile banking services so that even if people don't have a branch in their neighborhood, they can use their mobile phone in a much more uh, easy, easy way. We have a network of uh, almost 50,000 free ATMs around the country so people can get access to their money without having to pay a, a fee. And we were the first bank in New York City to take the municipal ID, for, ID card so that people who had difficulty getting an ID, people who might have documentation issues or transgender people or others who have difficulty getting IDs could have a picture form of ID that could be used to open a bank account. So a lot of people might be tuning in thinking, oh, he's just selling his services. You are kind of but you're also telling us something about an institution that is using those assets in a different way. So you're, you're making the bank available to people. How are you actually changing the way the bank itself operates? It? The, the, the most boring thing in the world would be able to just be a service provider like every other bank around the, around the country. We could do that, and we could probably make a successful business doing that. 
but the people who work for us truly believe in advancing a set of progressive causes. I think one of the most innovative things that we did is, is we looked at the situation that bank workers in this country mm -hmm. face. And it's a, it's a dirty little secret that in, in the wealthiest, most successful industry in the country, the financial services industry, you have an army of low wage workers. Average, average wage for a bank teller in this country is a little more than $12 an hour. There's a sea of security guards and food service workers and back office workers who, who, who make uh, a little more than minimum wage. We raise our minimum wage to $15 an hour. We, we indexed it so it would go up every year, and we've challenged the rest of the industry to do the same. That's the kind of things that we're trying to do, to not just be a bank that offers checking and savings accounts, but to really live our values and try and change society a little bit. Well, that really is a pretty dirty secret, this enormously wealthy industry. What proportion of your tellers did you find out were on public assistance? Well, in, in, in New York State, 40 per, about 40 percent of bank tellers are on some form of public assistance. It's, it's, it's just disgusting. So you were the first bank to raise the minimum wage across the board. You've also established this list of priorities. I think you're calling them principles, five principles. You want to lay those out too and have any of the other banks bought up? Bought bought into those two? Sure. Look, we, we basically looked at the situation since the financial collapse in 2008 when largely the financial services industry almost brought the economy to its knees, not, not just here but around the world. And we said, you know, a lot of that was based on, on the fact that our customers have lost a lot of trust in us because of that. And so we really passed four, five important principles of banking, and one was that our, earning our customers' trust was the most important mm -hmm. thing that we could do. Um, two, that we should embrace economic justice and we should stand up for things like fair wages, not just for bank employees, but employees all across the country. And we should be a loud, progressive business voice calling on progressive policies like that. We need to embrace transparency. We should be open in terms of how we make money and be open to sharing a portion of our profits with the kinds of causes that we believe in. And most importantly, and I think not to be forgotten, one of those principles is that regulation is not the enemy. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people out there clamoring that there are too many regulations inhibiting the banking industry, but we saw what happened when regulation wasn't strong, and we need to make sure yeah. that we have good consumer protections and good ways to keep the banking system safe and sound for future generations. So tell us about some of those principles in action. I'm thinking perhaps of your work with municipalities that are facing foreclosure or bankruptcy uh, crises. Um, also, your work in, in New York City with the uh, Development Corporation. Sure. So a few things. One is, a couple of years ago, the city of Scranton, Pennsylvania, um, was really facing economic peril and had been for some time, like many Rust Belt cities have. Um, the mayor of the city at the time had a great idea. He would solve the city's economic crisis by putting everybody on minimum wage. Um, the unions immediately sued, um, but they also called us and said, is there anything that you can do to help? Uh, so we dug in and we were able to provide uh, the, the, the city there with a, with a bank loan, a kind of untraditional way for municipalities to be financed. And um, they were able to um, get people back on their regular wages, settle with the unions, have some bridge financing so that they could meet their obligations. And That's, why were you willing to offer a loan when other people weren't? We were able to find a, a line of tax revenue that had not been collateralized um, for any other purpose. And I think when a lot of people looked at the situation, they just wanted to run the other way. We dug in and tried to figure out, was there a way to help the mm -hmm. firefighters and the police officers and the other municipal employees there to, to find a way to be part of the solution? I think the difference is that we don't just think that things are impossible. We, we don't always succeed. Sometimes things are pretty hard to do. But I think what makes us different is when we're confronted with difficult situations, we really try and get in, be a little unconventional, and see if there's a way to, to, to take the power of a bank charter that we have and put it to good use. If the sort of slogan coming out of Occupy Wall Street in the financial crisis of 2008 was break up the big banks, you're saying, I'm hearing from you, consolidate power. Let's use that power. It's kind of the opposite. A little bit, although I would call us a, a, a big, small bank. We're about $4 billion in assets. By comparison, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, Citibank are a trillion dollars in assets. So there is a, a, there is a giant uh, uh, consolidation of, uh, of power. But think about this. If, if, if you, it, the argument is that there's about 10 million yeah. overly progressive Americans out there. <laughs> the average bank account in this country is $5,000. 5,000 times 10 million equals $50 billion. Yeah. Um, $50 billion makes you a too big to fail financial institution. What if the left had its own too big to fail financial institution? We could really do something. Mm.
Jewish progressives born in Brooklyn but famous in Vermont. No, I'm not talking about Bernie Sanders, but Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield of Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream. Ben and Jerry turned a gas station ice cream parlor into a global phenomenon in Bernie Sanders' hometown of Burlington, Vermont. Since then, they've modeled what a lot of people say a progressive and massively successful business can actually look like. And they have continued to be outspoken on all sorts of issues, so it's no surprise they're going all out for Bernie Sanders for president. They've even made a Bernie ice cream. I am thrilled to welcome them back to the show. Jerry Greenfield, Ben Cohen, welcome to the program. Good to be here, Laura. Let's go back a little bit and talk about the two of you, then we'll talk about Bernie and what he's meant for you, what his policies have meant for you, and what brings you to this position. But to give people a bit of background, Ben, um, tell us how you grew up. How did you end up in Burlington making ice cream? Ah, well. Um, Briefly. Well, first, first, <laughs> first I met Jerry in uh, seventh grade gym class. We were the two slowest, fattest kids in the class. <laughs> Then I became uh, a failure as a potter. Uh, nobody would buy my pottery. Jerry became a failure as a uh, med school applicant. He got rejected from every school he applied to. And uh, we ran into each other and we said, well, we're both failures, what are we gonna do? And we decided to start an ice cream business. And Originally, we wanted to open in a warm, rural college town because we wanted to live in a rural college town. And we discovered that all the warm ones already had homemade ice cream parlors. And so we decided to throw out the criteria of warm <laughs> and ended up in Burlington, Vermont. So you're really an inspiration to failures everywhere. Yes, we are. And w so we ended up in Burlington right at the time that Bernie was starting his political career, uh, first as mayor of Burlington in the 80s. So let's talk about that. What difference, what was his, his platform in those days, if you can remember, and what difference did his policies make to a, a small business like yours? Well, so Bernie was running against the entrenched establishment uh, political machine Democrat incumbent who had been there, and, and Bernie ran uh, to everybody's surprise. He won by 10 votes and became mayor, and... Uh, We're talking 1981, was it? 80, yeah, 81? yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, probably Ben can tell you better, but one of the early issues there was around development of the waterfront at Lake Champlain, which prior to Bernie coming there, uh, the idea had been that it was going to be sold to developers and mm -hmm. they were going to be having high-end condominiums and, and the public was essentially going to be shut out. And uh, Bernie kind of came in as mayor and started talking about this idea of public access that you know nobody in Burlington had ever heard of before, but essentially what he was saying was that the waterfront of Burlington belongs to all the people of Burlington and uh, we shouldn't allow it to become uh, privatized and sold to these developers. And he ended up uh, fighting the developers all the way to the top court in the state, and he won. And today we have the most beautiful public waterfront in Burlington that's open to everybody. Mm. So public yeah, access was one thing. Another thing that I think he was very early in talking about was local purchasing, buy local, um, cultivating local businesses as opposed to trying to bribe outside multinationals to come in. Yeah, Bernie established the Community Economic Development Organization, which was responsible for that. And, you know, it's sort of funny because people outside of Burlington and Vermont have this idea of Bernie as not supportive of business. And yet, that's not true at all. Bernie has a very practical and pragmatic uh, approach, and he's a very good manager. Uh, he made the city run really well, uh, and if you look at Burlington now, it is the envy mm -hmm. of other cities. And so how did he help you? How did, how did his policies help you, broadly speaking? You know, it was a friendly business environment. Uh, it really encouraged uh, local businesses and encouraged uh, patronizing local businesses. And made it 
easy for us. How important do you think that word socialist is in the whole story? Because a lot of people are incredibly struck by the fact that somebody who's calling himself an independent democratic socialist is also getting this kind of crowd in a country that's been so big on red baiting over the years. You know, personally, uh, I, I call him a responsible capitalist. Uh, you know, I, I think that yeah, I mean, he's the kind of socialist that 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 believes in social security, that mm -hmm. kind of socialism. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, he believes in health care as a human right. Uh, I mean, I personally think, uh, you know, calling himself a, a democratic socialist uh, harms him in terms mm -hmm. of the general population. And uh, I mean, it. I, I've seen him in action. I mean, the guy is very much a capitalist, mm -hmm. uh, but he's just saying that we should have a form of capitalism that uh, has many more social benefits to it. You know, and you're, you're asking who is coming out to see Bernie, mm -hmm. who's getting excited. I think it's people who understand fundamentally that the system is broken, yeah. that, as Ben said, the economic and political system is rigged. I mean. We all know the system is rigged, right? Everybody knows it. The question is, is there something you can do about it? Are you willing to get committed to doing that? And people are joining Bernie's so-called political revolution because it's going to take millions of people to do something about it. But the movement continues, I guess, is what I'm yes, hearing. That yes. No matter what happens, the mobilization, I guess the expectation and hope is that this mobilization of two million contributors will change politics beyond just this year, you think? Well, I think it signals the end of political parties. You know, I mean, I think it used to be that political parties were necessary to raise the money mm -hmm. that you needed and to gather the volunteers that you needed. I think that Bernie is showing that that's not really required. Mm. Um, I mean, you know, all the, the whole democratic machine is arrayed against Bernie. Uh, you know, the Democratic National Party, which is supposed to be neutral uh, in this primary race, is throwing all their support behind Hillary. And despite that, yeah. despite that, he keeps on winning and he keeps on uh, doing better and better in the polling uh, versus Hillary. And finally, you know, if, you know, just the other scenario, we laid out one, if the other scenario is Hillary Clinton ends up at the end of the day, thanks to the superdelegates and others with the majority that she needs to be the nominee, what's going to happen to all of those Bernie voters? And will you vote for Hillary at the end of the day, if you have to? Uh, I'm, I'm really not sure. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm so sick of the Republicrats. Uh, you know, I mean, they're, both parties are, are in bed with Wall Street and Big Pharma and, uh, you know, the chemical companies. I mean, you name it. Uh, I, so, uh, I, I mean, so many of the people that are out there supporting Bernie are people that had checked out of politics, yeah. that, that said, you know, I'm not going to be involved in that system because it, it's not addressing any of the mm -hmm. things that I care about. It's mm -hmm. not really meeting any of the my needs. It, it's the both parties are serving uh, the corporations and the ultra wealthy. And you know, I I I personally don't believe that a lot of the people that have been activated by Bernie are gonna are gonna be voting for Hillary. Jerry, well. Uh, I'm, of course, doing all I can to get Bernie nominated. Uh, unlike Ben, I probably will vote for the Democratic person only because, uh, in my mind, the, the Democratic nominee is going to be so much better than anyone the Republicans are currently looking at. And uh, I'm hopeful that uh, going forward there, there will be no turning back, that yes, Maybe not everybody will stay activated who's become activated, but uh, you know, one of one of the things Bernie says in his rallies that everybody relates to is, "Enough is enough." Yeah, it's it's bull. Enough is enough. We either take the country back for the people, 
or we give it away to the corporations and the super wealthy. It's it's that simple. We should clarify you don't own the company anymore. No. Uh, tell don't. just briefly what happened. Uh, it's and you're still out there and still associated with it. You're like the ambassador, is that right? Is that how it works? Well, the company ended up getting sold. Right. Uh, Jerry and I struggled to keep it independent, uh, but the company was public at the time, and uh, you know the way the Security and Exchange Commission laws work is that if, if some other entity is yeah. offering a very high price for the stock, the board of directors is compelled to to sell it. Uh, so, despite our best efforts, the company did get sold. It's no longer owned by us. It's owned by uh, Unilever, and uh, we are technically employees of the company. You touched on it, that the current business law required you to sell out when you got an offer. Um, what might have changed that? So, so one of uh, the changes that's been happening is the beginning of what's known as B corporations, yeah. benefit corporations. And those are corporations that are now chartered in probably 30 states around the country and in countries all over the world as well. And when companies voluntarily decide to become a B Corp, they say that part of their purpose is public benefit. They are not simply about return to their shareholders. And it is this wildly growing movement. Yeah. Uh, it is amazingly popular. So if Ben and Jerry's had been a B Corp back then, you could have resisted the buyout? You know, I think it's probably one of the steps we could have looked at. It's pretty hard to go back and say, what could right. we have done? But uh, we, we certainly did not succeed in yeah. staying independent. Well, it's fascinating because I think maybe that was part of the, the thinking that went into the B Corp was watching what had happened. Because didn't it follow by not too many years? You know, it was probably one of the things that yeah. they thought about, but the idea, I mean, B Corp is very broad. It's not only uh, a charter issue, instructional tra uh, changes to corporations. It's about uh, assessments of corporations, looking how they do their community activities. So it's, it's pretty broad and it's also pretty deep. Yeah, all right. Thank you both, it's great talking to you. Good luck on the campaign. I hope you get a lot of those signs distributed. We'll make sure <laughs> people have information about how to get their own sign at our website. Uh, ben Cohen, Jerry Greenfield, thank you so much for coming in. Great seeing you, Laura. Automation, automation everywhere. Wherever you look, robots are in and precarious work is getting precariouser. Take telephone operators. It's been years since I spoke to one. I kind of miss them. Bank tellers are probably next. Business Insider reports that banks could see a 30% reduction in staff over the next 10 years. And along with the tellers are the bank branches in which they work. Mobile bank apps don't need real people or real estate, it turns out. The automated world's an efficient and cost-conscious world. At least that's what we're told. It's what I was told for about 20 minutes straight not long ago when on hold with an airline company. When they finally did pick up, or rather a computer picked up and took my details several times over, date, time, mother's maiden name, a mechanical voice then finally told me that I would save money and time by entering all that data again into a form online. Every minute of my time and custom, they assured me, is valuable and valued. But before they were finished, they hung up on me. Date, time, mother's maiden name. Having finally put all that in again and purchased a ticket, I arrived at the airport, checked in online, but still, I'm greeted by a screen that asks me sincerely about my packing and then directs me to a person who won't touch my bag but tells me to lift it myself onto a scale and then carry it off to a distant conveyor belt. There's a retirement home somewhere filled with unhappy baggage handlers and travel agents, I'm sure of it. Finally, though, I was through the security check, now the most up-close and personal part of the whole experience, and into the departure lounge, once the site of cheap restaurants and dark sports bars. The chatty waitstaff have all been replaced by iPad-like tablets on every table, I discovered. Glowing green, they reflect the irate faces of all the frustrated customers. No chatty waiter, no barman with an eye on your flights, only a harried food carrier who says she can only respond to the computer. It's all enough to make you almost relish the crush of crowded flesh against flesh on the actual airplane. Someone somewhere may be saving money, but efficient? 
For whom? Not me, if you tally up all that screen time. And what's the price, do you think, if we put one on human-to-human -human connection?